Good afternoon, Pune. It's such a happening city with incredibly warm people. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the ocean. I've always found the ocean to be so incredible. The wind, the waters, and the waves. And for many years, right from when I was a child, it continues to fascinate me. So I'd like to talk about a little bit about a story that happened to me when I was six years old. When my family decided to go on a vacation at the beach, and I was six years old, we, were in, we arrived in the evening only to find out that I was not allowed to get into the water until the sun had risen. That night was absolutely, absolutely exciting, and I couldn't go to sleep at all. Early in the morning, before anybody else could wake up, I woke up, stood on the stool, opened the door, went out into the ocean, one step at a time, daring a little bit more every, every uh, little bit, and went ahead over there. As I was doing that, I realized, probably after an hour or so, that I, my dad was coming frantically trying to get me out of that, uh, out of the ocean. And there were fishermen who had informed him about my escapade into the ocean. He very quickly came in. He got his shoulders dislocated for the first time, but managed to get me out of there, back onto the uh, safer environment. Happy to see his child back into a safe place. I think that was my first lesson on risk. It was a lesson that allowed me to understand what risk was about, but it also gave me a joy that tells me what the unknown is going to be about, what the unknown gives you. So I'd like to talk a little bit about one little quote by Einstein which said, a ship is safe at the shore, but that's not what it's built for. And when I look at my life, when I look at how I've grown up, I find that getting into the unknown, understanding that, but with a little more understanding of risk as I've grown up, hopefully, is what is who I am, and that's probably encoded in my genes. So I think when we look at it, um, the present today is pregnant with the future. This is a famous quote by Voltaire. And everything that we see today or we saw yesterday is what the future is going to be like. And what I want to do right now is to show you a little trailer. Many of you might have already seen it, but I want to emphasize that this was a movie that was created in 1997, much before the human genome was even completed. And what you'll see today is that a lot of things that were started at that time are now commonplace. Genetics, what can it mean? The ability to perfect the physical and mental characteristics of every unborn child. In the not too distant future, our DNA will determine everything about us. A minute drop of blood, saliva, or a single hair determines where you can work, who you should marry, what you're capable of achieving. So as you can see, that in 1997, a lot of people had already thought what you could possibly do, and not everything of what is said in that video today is, is already there, but a lot of it is, like understanding a lot of about your genes through your saliva or blood. Now, I'm going to tell a little bit about my journey in genomics. It started many, many years ago, about 13 years ago, a long time in, my, in, in the genomics space. When I was looking at a field to, to start my venture in, I think I found genomics to be incredibly exciting. It was intellectual, it was difficult, and it was unique. And I knew that that was somewhere where I could really be able to create something. Clearly, I was in my early, late 20s, and I had no clue what I was getting into, much like getting into the ocean when I was six. As I went in with a very small team and managed to build a very large company, which grew in very extraordinary ways, I realized that I was able to create something that could make a big impact in the way people looked at Indian companies in this space. What we were doing was creating research as a service model. It was incredibly exciting. It was a great way of being able to build a lot upon creating products, being able to create the concept, and that allowed us to understand the changing paradigm in life sciences. But 12 years into this whole, into that journey, I felt a void. And I felt that there was something that, even though people understood what we did was difficult and interesting, 
I wasn't being able to impact people who were around me in any way. And I think that felt wrong. And I wanted to change that. And so what I did was I was trying to find what is it that would allow me to create that sense of purpose and to be able to give back to the society in a way that I wanted to. What you see over here is a picture. It's a picture that is on a book called Against the Gods. And when I was sitting about a couple of years ago, sitting again at the ocean during one of our vacations and reading this book, one of the things that struck me was this was a book which was about risk. It was a book that described many different ways that you could look at risk and how to manage it. The picture on this is a, picture by, is a painting by Rembrandt, and this is called The Storm at the Sea of Galilee. Now, when you look at this picture, you find something very interesting. You find the sea is rough, but you find that just because the sea is rough or the ocean is rough, people don't not go in there. But one of the things that you'll find is that as people go into the rough ocean without a navigation tool or without a way to be able to understand what lies ahead of them, they are restricted by the sheer amount in terms of accidents, in terms of the distance they traveled. In many ways, I thought that possibly health can be looked upon in the same way if we could apply genetics to that. And I think that was the idea that was building inside me to say, what is it that we can do with, with, with understanding genetics? How is that going to impact people? And how is that going to allow people to be able to say, how do I manage my risk better? And how do I travel further distances? And I think that's what I think about when I started, when we started off with, with Map My Genome to say, how do we get people to understand what their health risk is about and what do they need to do to travel further distances in their health? And so, you know, one of the questions I asked myself is, in the 10 years that I've, 12 years that I've been around, I've seen huge changes in, in, in the whole genomics industry. But I question myself, what will it be like in 2050? And I think one of the conclusions I've come to is that in the year 2050, genomics is not going to be the coolest thing that it is today. But it is definitely going to be the foundation on which almost everything in, in healthcare will be based on. And I think that's a comforting thought that you're able to be play a role in that revolution, in that change in paradigm that we are seeing. So if you look at this picture, which was, which was uh, published in, a, in, in the Journal of Personalized Medicine, there is this concept of, of personalized healthcare. What we see over here is that we are trying to bring the care back much before the cure in, in this case. The individual is at the center of all of that, all of the entire healthcare chain, where you start, as a consumer, you start creating your own data. You're looking at uh, always on health gadgets. Now, these could be gadgets like a tracking band that you see today, but it could be probably be inside your body at some point. But there is also now the concept, if you think about it, if everything was, was in your hands to be able to control and you had public health or physicians only at the time of need as an exception, that would be a very different world of healthcare. And I think that's what is exciting. And you can see that all of this on the underlying health records will have genetics, and it will have a lot of things about genetics, about you, that you will be able to base all these decisions on. I think this is a picture that almost everybody recognizes. Um, I think, and it was very lucky in terms of timing of when this, was, this came out. Angelina Jolie published an article uh, in the New York Times called My Medical Choice. And she explained how genetics, how she had done a genetic test on the BRCA genes for breast cancer, and that allowed her to make a medical choice. But she also mentioned in that same article that it was because of the family history, the fact that her mother had died of breast cancer, and soon after we saw that there was also her aunt that died of breast cancer, that the doctors had estimated a risk of 87%. So this was a decision that was aided not only by looking at the current condition, but also was aided by the fact that the medical family history showed that, and the genetic risk also showed that, that added to a risk of 87%. And, and I think by doing the double mastectomy, which disappointed a lot of people, uh, not, not her, uh, but, uh, but many other of her fans, that this could actually make a change, and she could get the risk down to 5%. Following that, uh, there was a flurry of activities. Almost everybody around, uh, including the media, 
started asking us questions. Thankfully, we were in the right place at the right time. Got us a lot of publicity, but it, it also raised a lot of different questions. The question was, what does this mean to an average person, right? People misread through the lines, and there are a few things that people start to think about. Is it that anybody and everybody should do a test, and will that mean a lot of different things to different people? So this is the kind of thing people ask me. One is, does it mean that you can actually predict when I'm going to die? Uh, second is, can you tell whether I'm, you're going to change what my genetic makeup is? The third is, are you going to cut off any of my body parts just because I have a genetic risk? And then does it mean that, or as you say, does it mean that we can actually prevent and prolong our lives? And I think that is, that is probably what was exciting. It raised questions, it raised awareness, but it also raised a lot of anxiety levels. A few months later, there was yet another scary proposition, that of designer babies. There was a patent that was filed, and a lot of people started coming and asking us, what does this whole thing mean? Now, what we are trying to get at is that a lot of people misunderstand what all of this means, because we, we all read this far too often in science fiction, far too often in our own minds. So it's a little bit difficult for people to understand that what we are looking at right now is just a tool to be able to help and aid their own health decisions. So these are the sort of questions that have come in. So what I thought would do is to just get to very basics of what is genome sequencing about. And the four building blocks, the A, C, and T, and G, are very similar to what we see as the zeros and ones of the digital world. And one of the things that I want to say is not just a description of what the chemical substances or the, what A and C and T and G stand for, but rather what is it that we are going to see, how does that going to impact in the near future? So if I look at A, C and T and G, one of the things that we're going to start seeing is that we're going to see an aging population that's going to live much longer. We're going to see people, and hopefully that includes us, that we will start living almost to up to 100 and beyond. And I think what that means is that it's not going to be something that is treatable in the near term with the kind of budgets that we're currently dealing with. When we start looking at the ABCD type of disease, and by ABCD I mean like an Alzheimer, a breast cancer, cardiovascular disease, or, or diabetes, one of the things that we can see is that these are going to take way too much money to cure if you're going to go by the current approach. Whereas if you look at it from from dealing of these ABCD or the non-communicable kind of diseases from a personalized medicine approach, it allows us to segment populations. It allows us to be able to focus our attention on a specific disease, on a specific group of people that need the attention the most. And that allows us to be able to take our resources, optimize them, much like an entrepreneur does with the limited resources that you have. So whether you look at it from an individual point of view, whether you look at it from a state point of view, or from a country point of view, it makes a lot of sense to look at personalized medicine to be able to help us solve these problems. The other thing is that lifestyle is going to matter a lot um, in, in solving these problems. And understanding of that at any different level is going to make a huge difference. The second thing is testing. It has become much more affordable today to test for, for genetics or ge uh, genetic tests than it ever was before. And I, I'll show you a few graphs in, 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 in the coming slides that will allow you to understand how that has impacted all of us in terms of the pricing, the, the output, and so on. So the testing is going to become much more cheaper than it has ever before. And you'll start seeing that this change is going to be very, very rapid over the next few years. The third is the genes. What is it about the genes and the genetic predisposition that allows us to understand about ourselves? Most of these are based on very large studies that have been done in populations. And when you start looking at it and saying, right now you have a very small amount of studies that have been done. As everybody gets sequenced, you can imagine the amount of not just correlations, but you can start to understand a real cause of disease. And you will be able to look at many different things much beyond what we are doing today. So you can also look at saying, once you have all that data, can you really measure? And can you be able to make sure that you can have the tools to be able to manage that? And then finally is the consumers that will rule because of the wellness sensors and because of the cheap sensors and uh, data generation, many other things that will allow consumers to actually generate the kind of data that we have today. So where is sequencing today? 
And I think if you look at sequencing, one of the things is that the Human Genome Project was completed in 2001 with a cost of about $100 million. That was not very long ago. Uh, and this is a graph that shows you that. It's about $100 million. When you look at 2011, you find that the cost of that is about $5,000. That's an incredible fall that is not found in, in most other places or any other place, uh, any other subjects. When you look at the cost per genome, you'll find that Moore's law keeps being talked about everywhere. And, and genomics stopped defying those laws somewhere in the middle of 2008, possibly inspired by the financial crisis or defying it. When you look at the, the technology behind it, just a few days ago, we lost one of our most famous scientists of the genomic era, Dr. Fred Sanger. He was the one that actually started the whole genomic revolution, and he got two Nobel Prizes in this space. One of the things that he did was to invent a method called the Sanger method that continues to be used even today. But what you start seeing is that in the last 10 years of what, what has happened in this world, we have gone from manual gel-based systems towards capillary-based sequencing, towards massively parallel uh, sequencing systems that we, we see today, to being a single molecule system. What does that mean? It has gone from being you know, one of those things where you find biologists sitting and working late at night towards getting to a degree of precision that you can't imagine. If you look at the, the output of the systems that you're looking at, just about 2001, you'd find outputs in a few kilobytes. What you're seeing now is in 10 to the power of 14. You can find that these kind of numbers can baffle anybody. So the first big data that applications that we used have been used in genomics because we suddenly saw this massive shift in terms of how this whole uh, revolution was happening. So what does it mean for an individual? It means that they can actually get a test done and be able to understand that uh, from a point of view of their disease predisposition and also being able to understand what they're, how they're going to react to certain drugs and how they're going to actually understand their ancestries and so on. And what do we do with that? I think one of the things that people do is that they don't get blood tests done, but what you are doing, I mean, not some people think that you come in and you are going to be able to be put into a room where we take all kinds of things from you, but actually we're just trying to solve it by taking the spitting habits of Indians, making them spit into a tube and not anywhere else. And I think that's the way you're going to do it. You've ultimately come up with the report. And that's the sort of thing that you get in terms of pictures. So as we enter a brave new world, one of the things I want to say is that, I'll end with, is that Victor Hugo once said that all the forces in this world are not so powerful as an idea whose time has come. And I think that idea is genomics, and its time has come. Thank you very much. Thank you.